Uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to speak here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the City Money Gallery. I don't know, just by a traditional show of hands, how many people have actually been down to the City Money Gallery? Has anyone seen it here? That's three. Okay, that's great. <laughs> um, actually, one of you used to work at the British Museum, so you should have seen it. <laughs> There's no way you can get away from it. Um, it's actually... Um, it was reopened in June last year. Um, we previously had the Money Gallery from 1997. Now, this is the Money Gallery here. This is as it looks now. Um, we're wonderfully situated here, because just through that door on the left-hand side, obviously, you have the Manchester uh, Money Gallery. As I said, our example at the museum was opened in 1997, and it was actually one of the first of its kind, if not the first of its kind, in terms of how it wanted to represent money. Money beforehand, we, when you look at coinage and these various types of money, are always part of a bigger collection. They're always part of a bigger display. And they offer chronology sometimes. Um, and, and what we wanted to do at the museum was to really focus on money and try and tell a history of the world, but through the money which um, pervades it. So if I show you the next slide, this is the Money Gallery as it looked before we reopened. So this was when it was sponsored by HSBC. We're now sponsored by the American Bank City. So this is previously. You'll see... Um, Start changes straight away in terms of colour scheme and so on. Um, the cases are still the same. We, we weren't able to change the cases. But one of the major changes we've made is actually what we're displaying and how we're displaying it in the cases. Um, I suppose it's fascinating. What we always say about the gallery itself in its new incarnation is that you, know, that you can tell a history of the world. There is this element where money does obviously pervade all of human society to some extent. From, we deal with about 4,500 years of history in the gallery. If I talk you through the way it kind of works, the narrative way, you can kind of see how money can have, any collection of money you have particularly, can have wonderful uh, possibilities in terms of display and can actually really complement other things, as well as standing alone and telling these huge world stories, but with small objects. So as you walk into the gallery, as you stand here, you're about four and a half thousand years ago. It's a chronological, it's chronological look. So as you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, at the end of the gallery tunnel, um, is the Greek and Roman life gallery, as you walk into the British Museum. So we're dealing with about 4,500 years of history. We say 4,500 years. We're not saying that this is when kind of trade and commerce obviously begins. What we're saying is this is where we have records of kind of monetary transactions as we understand it. So on the right-hand side, you'll see in a bit, you look at the different forms of money that have been used through the years. You look at the, uh, the way in which um, different substances, different materials have a particular value within society. Um, there's a beauty in this in the sense that everyone who goes to the museum nowadays has an understanding of money, has a conception of what it means to them. You know, a lot of it, maybe a lot of the time, people don't have enough of it, essentially. But that's at least your reaction to it. And that's a reaction that people have had for the last, you know, four and a half thousand years longer. So there is that wonderful ability of money to completely cut through the ages, essentially. And you can tell these huge stories. Um, in the middle, you'll see some other objects. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about this central case in a moment. But you'll also see we have machinery, which talks about the production side of money. So the, the banknote machines, uh, the way uh, coin striking and so on. On the left-hand side, we're dealing with money in the way in which it's dealt with by rulers, by authorities. And I think it's an important distinction to make. So we, we, you see the way in which money has this life uh, and how it is a, a wonderful means of communicating certain things that rulers, authorities, you know, central banks and so on want to communicate. And on the right-hand side, we're actually looking at how it's used in daily life. So there's that wonderful duality with money that once it's actually released into the system, it suddenly takes on a world of its own, a life of its own. And some of the stuff on the right-hand side isn't obviously officially issued at all. It's, it's a response to a problem that society, you know, tries to answer on its own without these kind of all-encompassing uh, rulers and so on. Now, I just want to show some of the uh, examples of what we have in the gallery. Uh, two particularly that you'd expect, and maybe one you wouldn't, to show that you can discuss money without using money, if you see what I mean. So by using your collections, you can also incorporate a whole manner of other different objects which still talk about humans' relationship to money, society's relationship to money. Um, here we have an example of one of the first coins. So it's 7th century BC in Lydia, as we understand now, of Turkey, kind of parts of modern Turkey, is Lydia. Um, and it's a simple idea, yet it is a world-changing idea. So this idea of standardising lumps of metal to give them a value, uh, imprinting them with this particular symbol showing that they can then be transported easily, that they then can exist in other places. They, you, know, you can guarantee the weight of them if you standardise it, if you give it an official seal of approval. So this is an example of the first coin. And similarly, this is an example of the first banknote. So another simple idea, but it completely changes the world, because here we suddenly, we're not dealing with bullion, we're dealing with trust. 
Now, what this banknote does, um, created in China in the 14th century, it is representing those coins in the middle. You see that they're kind of like a thousand cash. So this represents a thousand cash of coins. Um, and it talks about it. And I can't read Chinese, but I'm reliably informed. It talks about the fact this is called uh, uh, flying cash. It's meant to circulate forever. And underneath it, uh, it talks about the fact that if you counterfeit it, you will be executed. So it's a very, a very brusque kind of... I mean, if you imagine walking around with money now that had the same message, you'd you know, feel slightly put upon, uh, to say the least. So these are things that you may expect. These are things that are fairly obvious in terms of, if we're talking about history of money, we're lucky enough, obviously, with our collection. We have something like a million objects in our collection, which is a vast amount. Um, but we're lucky in that sense to have this variety. But then also, similarly, this is in the, this is in the gallery as well. Now, it may seem a little glib, it may seem a little trite, um, but what it is talking about is the way in which we deal with money today. So it's a Barbie cash register. Um, I'm sure we've all got one. Um, <laughs> no? Okay, fine, you're missing out. It's brilliant. Um, and what this talks about is the fact that this is for ages 0 to 3, but it comes with its own American Express card on the right-hand side. Okay, now I'm not making a moral point about that at all, but it's just interesting that in the same way that you used to have plastic money as children when you were learning at school, now it's moved on to this idea of money that doesn't even exist even. We're talking about plastic money. Um, it never denies your card. It will never stop you spending the money. And the four things you can buy are electronics, beauty, toys, and food. And they're the only four things you can buy, and you can buy them forever, essentially, <laughs> using this machine. <laughs> so, but these three things exist in a history of money, and yet they talk about, you know, they have the beauty of being objects that, that you know, take us right back to two and a half thousand years ago, but similarly... They talk about the 21st century in which we live today as well. And that's the beauty of money. That's the pervading nature of it. So having money in your collections, in your various museums, is not, uh, it's not a simple display of display. It can open up so many different possibilities. Um, this is the old display. Now, I've shown this because the money gallery as was, so before last year, had something like 3,000 objects. Now we have 1,500 so we've cut it down incredibly. And it was an idea to be more precise, uh, to have less objects on display. Whilst understanding the beauty of some of the coinage and the money systems, there is also the inherent thing of a lot of them look the same. So, <laughs> and we're not under any you know, illusions that they don't. You, you've seen that up close, coins can look beautiful, different. I mean, Ian shows some wonderful portraits and so on. So you can really get an idea of, of the emperor, of the rulers through their portraits. But you understand that too many of them, people just switch off. And people just see it all as lumps on the wall. So what we tried to do is really be more precise in the stories we're trying to tell. Um, so we're only having maybe 10 objects on a board. With the larger objects, this is China. So we have the cowrie shells, we have jade, uh, substances, products that actually held a monetary value. And we tried to make it more interesting in terms of what objects are on display. So there's a greater variety as well when we're talking about the origins of money. And at the end you can see it some gold coins at the end there. That's it. And again, gold always attracts people, obviously. <laughs> the nature of it. But also there are ways in which you can display things that really bring them out. So a perfect example of this is, in every case in the money gallery, we have something called a highlight panel. Now you can spot it here because it's the raspberry. It's not pink, it's raspberry. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of appropriate, Max, so I think you, have, you use a lot of kind of, uh, you can see the walls and so on and the windows, all kind of this pink colour. And these are highlight panels. So what we're trying to do there, what was the design came up with, was this idea that we have a very large number of people coming through the gallery, so we understand they're not going to stand and read every single label and look at every single object. So one of the great ways of doing it is if you can choose a panel within a case, use that as a highlight object, so you get a sense of what the case is trying to tell you. If you think you've garnered enough from that, then you can move on, and you can navigate your way around the gallery just using these panels. Similarly, if you want to learn more, then you can then find out and put that panel in context of what's going on in this period. So it's a chronological look at money, but similarly then it's a, them a thematic look at money as well. This is just an example of a label. Um, the labels used to be 10 by 10. They've grown in size, but as they grow in size, perversely we reduce the words. So, <laughs> so what we have here is just an example of one of the labels. Um, this, of course, brings its own challenges, and it's a, one of the, the major challenges that was... Um, that was met by the whole department, everyone who was involved in the, the, the project itself was led by Katie Eagleton. Um, I, came into, um, I came into the post after um, when the gallery opened. 
Um, and one of the big things is trying to work out how you can get the most amount of information across and tell the best story, but not using language which is somehow prohibitive. Um, you don't use specialist terminology and so on. Try and be <coughs> as precise as what you're trying to say, but similarly, uh, not. it's a very difficult level to try and hit in terms of language. So you see it's a simple description at the top, and in the middle you have about 50 to 60 words in which to describe the objects. In this case, we're talking about two different objects. Um, and just trying to get the point across, and that's the real difficulty, you know, that's the real challenge, essentially, in lots of this, when you talk about money, because whilst in the department we're lucky enough to have all this expertise in the department, um, and people understand the terminology and so on, it's, it's another thing getting that across, obviously. This shows you some of the themes, and this is all a, um, on the website, and what it is, is it's, uh, it's a breakdown of all the themes within the gallery. So these are some of the things you can talk about using the collections of money you may have. Um, every case has a different theme, so we're running chronologically, so the beginnings of money, beginnings of coinage, and so on. You can see there's a huge variety of things you can talk about. Um, and here's a perfect example. It's just a, once you click on one of these objects, you are then told a specific story. Now, we're lucky in the sense that this coin, for me, this collection is very important. It's the only coin we know detailing this king of Kent. Um, but from this one, one coin, you may have one coin, you know, in your collection, you can tell a, a story. You can tell a huge story about Britain. And it's the same with any kind of coinage you may have in your collection. It's, it's part of a bigger story, essentially. And that's what we're trying to get across. <coughs> this was a, yeah, so it's a fascinating uh, a way to tell other stories. This is another set of themes that we have in the gallery, um, which, again, you know, uh, they cover a myriad of different topics, so for money society, money merchants in the world tradition innovation and then we go up to modern money so what we've tried to do is incorporate as well a look at modern money because that's just much of the history of, uh, you know is, uh, is looking at coins from the Roman period or any other the way in which we use money today is just as relevant in the gallery so sitting alongside in the same room as you have these kind of ancient Roman hordes we'll also have credit cards we obviously have the Barbie cash register and we have uh, old monetary systems and so on This I want to draw attention to because this is the central case. Now, every year, well, no, about three in the last five years, we've had an evaluation done of the money gallery itself. And we've had, one, uh, we've had two done since it was reopened. And what's interesting is to see in which it's actually designs that will draw people's attention, obviously. So in the centre there, what you have, you have a, a spiral. Um, I think the designer called it a vortex, actually. Uh, <laughs> but what we have here is a group of uh, Roman uh, Forgeries, contemporary forgeries, like Ian was talking about earlier. And next to them is a, a large sway of uh, modern one pound coins that are all forgeries. Now that makes an immediate point, obviously, as Ian made earlier, talking about the moment coins are created, they're immediately forged. And that's as true today as it was then, in terms of. So the Royal Mint suggests that one in 30 coin, one pound coins is a forgery. So immediately everyone suddenly starts to think, oh, maybe. <laughs> and then you can have a look, and invariably there'll probably be some here. So, it's that linking that you can make with money. It's that fact that people have an understanding of it and then suddenly putting two things of vastly different periods of time, but the, the problems are still the same, the issues are still the same. And, it makes, and also the display itself is on a pink panel, it's, it's vibrant, and you, you get this idea of kind of action, a bit of, of, of vibrancy as well. So in the cases, you can see religion and power and signs of authority, uh, two different topics. And again, you'll see the, uh, the pink panels. On the right-hand side, you're looking at Spanish reals pieces of eight, and on the left-hand side it's uh, Islamic coinage. So this is kind of non-iconographic culture, looking at inscriptions instead. And here's a, a shot, as you can see, uh, from the two swirls. Now, also we, as I said, we, de we, we took objects away. So just as this is one panel and it contains one object, and this is the suffragette penny, which some of you, it was in the history of the world the Radio 4 programme, History of the World and 100 Objects, I think it's number 93 or 5. Um, and it's a, a simple one penny coin that has been stamped um, with the phrase votes for women. So it's that communicative aspect of money as well. So again, it's the money, once it's moved out of its common circulation, once it's moved out, taken away from the authority, it can suddenly become a different tool altogether. And I was speaking to, um, when the gallery first opened, I was speaking to someone who was who was suggesting that these are kind of the first kind of modern media, the mass media, where you know, these are your first, your Twitter or so on, or your first Facebook, in the sense that you suddenly you can stamp something, it can circulate, and it can exist away from your sphere. 
it's a, it's, a, it's a small denomination coinage, so it's not going to be possible to withdraw that from circulation. It, it, you know, it'd be too time consuming. There's far too many of them from this point in the early 20th century in terms of just one penny pieces for it to be possible. So it's a perfect medium to express yourself. And again, that's another aspect of money. Um, it can become a political tool as much as an economic one. And again, this is found on its uh, pink panel uh, highlight object. This is an object you want to talk about because when you have, they look fairly mundane. And I don't know whether anyone, I'm sure museums here, I'm sure museums you're coming from probably have us, uh, examples of this, which is kind of token coinage from the 17th century, from about 1640 to 1670. Um, obviously, we had myriad problems in England. You had civil war, Commonwealth, the reinstatement of the monarchy, and so on. But during this period, there's a huge lack of small change. So what local businesses did was create their own coinage. Now, that may seem uh, not exactly well, uh, you know, the most exciting idea in the world, but what it does is it suddenly gives us an idea of actually what our high streets, what our communities may have looked like through this small coinage. So this small coinage was created by different uh, independent businesses. In this case, it's for a coffee shop outside the museum in Great Russell Street by a man, for a man called Timothy Child. So immediately you have a name, you can then look through, um, you can look through registers and so on, and you'll find out that these people were prominent within the society. In, Amer in, in America, in London, there were far more of these available than in local issues. So whole streets, each different business would issue their own uh, to token coinage. But it also happens out in other big cities around and other towns as well. Um, as a point, this is Great Russell Street here. This is where the museum is now. So anything north of the museum, if anyone knows where Euston and King's Cross are, that was all fields, and you had the separate villages of Hampstead and all these places before the north of the museum. So immediately, using this one object, you're then talking about the local community. You're talking about local shopping habits, which is, again, something everyone has relevance with. You're talking about the way money works outside of those systems that are deemed to be uh, the official system. So in 1672, when Charles II comes back, uh, was, uh, is, sorry, finds his way to the throne, he releases a proclamation which says that all these kind of token coins are a terrible blight, they've been terrible for the local people, for the people of England. It's complete rubbish, essentially. They were an answer to a problem and they work very well. So here is a show of how you can, using other objects, talk about token coinage. So here are the tokens and underneath you have some of the objects. So the tokens above are talking about apothecaries and then beneath we have some apothecary jars. And all manner of different businesses made these. Um, so, so, you know, there's a huge scope. And here's one from Manchester. So here's one from our collection that's um, it's for a man called William Lyle um, at Upper Shambles. And he was, by the look of the, sh uh, if you look at the sugar lumps, uh, uh, yeah, sugar loaves, he was a grocer. So immediately you have a place. Grocers were incredibly influential during this period, 17th century, in terms of uh, their, their, their role within society. They could be mayor, uh, local mayors, they could be church wardens. So you can tell these huge stories from one small object. And a fairly unassuming object at that. You know, it's no bigger than a, probably a tenpence piece, small in fact, and the tenpence piece. Um, and yet you have a name, which then you can research further and try and find more information about. That's just one example. Um, another is here showing other objects that aren't monetary based. They say, no, they're not money but they have a relationship with money, so these are weights from West Africa. And interestingly, these are weights which, whilst they're performing a functionality, there is also that element of artistic, uh, an artistic element to them as well. So you'll see that they're for gold weights, but they said the guy sitting there is a European. So it's a West African a take on a European, and you see the, the rifle. But these are all actually performing a functional aspect as well. And they're all part of the history of money as a result. And this is um, the coin spiral in the museum, in the gallery. What it is, is a coin from every country in the world recognised by the UN. Now, this is kind of... It's interesting. It starts with Afghanistan in the middle and then spirals out. You'll see the top left, there's a small plastic disc. That's for South Sudan. They don't issue coinage at the moment. So since their creation, they haven't issued coinage, any banknotes. But what this does is something that's fairly mundane, which are just local, you know, which are just national currencies makes it slightly more visually appealing. And it's fascinating to see people come from over the world, yet the first thing they love to see is something from their own country. So it's amazing. I mean, it, it's a wonderful thing. I'm massively in trouble if new countries are created. 
So as much as it looks wonderful, it is incredibly restrictive in that sense. That's a, you know, it's always things to think about. So unless it begins with Z, um, which <laughs> if any new country is created, we can all maybe petition the UN to make sure it begins with Z, uh, then I can fit it in. But otherwise, it means shifting everything. So it's aesthetically very pleasing, but there are obviously problems with displaying certain things as well. Um, and these are issues to think about. It also shows, interestingly, that a, a large number of these are actually made in the Royal Mint in uh, Cardiff. So whilst they present uh, national identities, they are still made, you know, a lot of them are made in the same place. And also a lot of, uh, a, a fair few of the national currencies are also dollars for countries, not just America, obviously, but other countries have dollars as their official currency. So it's a simple way of making the point about monetary unions, about the variety of images you find on coins, about how different countries want to present themselves. But it does it in a fairly you know, appealing way, visually. And this is the online resource that goes with it, um, which, shows, which is a breakdown of all the various coins. So here we have Afghanistan to Austria. Um, now hordes, I think hordes are fascinating because not only I th I th um, because they were very much a period in time, obviously. And this is a hoard which was found in Bath. And the top one I'm talking about here was found in Bath. And this is part of a case that does change. So we have a number of cases in the museum that change regularly, talking about different um, aspects. Um, and here we have a display about the, a Bath hoard that was found in 2007. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, 2007. Um, and what it's doing is not just talking about the hoard itself, but it's also talking about the process of conservation. So I think people are as interested, because Henry did this display, I think people are as interested in the way in which things, the processes that are involved with the archaeological excavation of things and the processes involved as, as they are in the objects themselves. So this was a large kind of, I suppose, how would one describe it, that side of the tea chest, let's say, when it came in a huge lump of soil and then it was been slowly excavated and we were able to show the different tools used in excavation. Um, and people do find that very interesting because, you know, that uncovering of the past is fascinating. It's just a different take on it. So just as one label can talk about the role of these particular coins within Roman society, another talks about the fact that this is how we found them, this is how they have been treated, and this is the processes that have gone through to treat them. Here we are, the close-up. So you see the various tools. I mean, pretty, pretty uh, advanced tools, toothbrushes, uh, <laughs> paintbrushes. <laughs> All of these things are part of being used by our conservation team to work on the hall. As well, people like piles as well. People either like single object or they like piles. So somewhere in, you know, <laughs> people love to see a large hoard, and I think it's a really effective way of displaying. And then there was this um, uh, blog Henry co-wrote, which supports it as well. So we try, and when we do a redisplay in the gallery, we then try to get some website presence about it as well to hopefully encourage people to come in and see it. Um, it can be a simple few hundred words, or it can be a greater example, and these are just means that people, when they click on the website, they realise that the money gallery is changing, that objects change regularly, that different displays are happening, so it's not a, you know, it's not a, a static presentation of objects. Um, right, coming to the end. Um, this is an, another example of how objects which seem slightly, you know, uh, incongruous, I suppose, to some extent, actually have relevance to what we're trying to say. So this is talking about modern money. This particular display on the left-hand side changes regularly, but here we're talking about Kenya and Sierra Leone. But we're taking objects um, which, to some, and so we have a T-shirt there in the middle and then a, a, an advert, but it's all talking about... It's a discussion about how you display money now that money is increasingly non-existent, if you see what I mean. Obviously, it's all you know, numbers on the screen, essentially. So you have to think about other ways to display it, and that's, what we, that's the challenge that we have. To think about how you talk about modern monetary systems and how you use the objects that we take as everyday life, but they can actually tell a bigger story. Um, and here we are. We, we were lucky enough to obviously have some video screens as well, which we can edit and then tell a bigger story about them. So what we can't fit in the case, we can then talk about on the screens. And then finally, we have a hands-on desk, very much like outside at the Manchester. This is really, uh, again, when we've done the evaluation of the museum and we're seeing what parts of gallery people are moving to, one of the major ones they go straight to is, um, is the hands-on desk. So this is showing elements, not from our collection, but they're just uh, objects that we've accrued or, or, or put, uh, you purchased specifically for, to be used, you know, in, for the public. 
And there's a whole myriad of different objects which can be then put together by the volunteers themselves. Um, and they can put together different objects talking about different themes. But it's an immediately a way that people interact. It's very good for school groups and so on as well. And with lots of the objects, um, coinage and so on, is, fa is of course the durable. The reason we have lots of it is because it's so durable. So it's that wonderful element that you can, with a certain amount of, uh, obviously, attention and so on, but you can get, let it be handled. There's obviously, you know, it's a great way, of, um, great way of interacting with people. I went to a school last week and we took some objects and they were, they said, you know, they were actually almost fearful of touching them. And it was like, don't worry. You know, but immediately they became involved and immediately they became far more interested and, you know, uh, and willing to discuss about them. Um, and this is just a way. And this is also part of another education uh, program we're running, which not only do I work on the gallery, but I'm also helping with the education program with our education manager. And that's the idea to increase through our history of money, through the, the, our collection, is talk about financial literacy for secondary school, which is something that a lot of museums don't do in terms of that age group. It's an, um, um, we do a lot of work in the British Museum on primary school, but secondary school we don't really do. And I think money is that beautiful thing that you can really talk about the issues of today, you know, and really talk about how we are, in some respects, what we're doing is repeating mistakes in the past, but similarly we have new challenges when it comes to money, uh, which, uh, which completely inform the way in which we live. So it, it can be a great way of interacting with um, a teenage audience as well um, and to really get them interested in talking about money. So uh, that's a quick race through what we, what we have in the gallery and hopefully you know, maybe some ideas. It's by no means the perfect way, but it is a way and it's just the way that, you know, the museum has decided to do it. Um, but hopefully you know, it may be of interest. And please, if you do come down to the museum, it would be great to uh, you know, show you around or to chat about it or anything. I'm more than happy to. So if you have any questions, thank you very much.